Hello again. My name is Venerable Sister Kama, and I'm back to visit you again with a, another note or a little bit more information about reweaving the Dhamma cloth. And I hope I can help you a little bit more. Today, um, we had some questions that we are still asking. We started last time and we asked who the Buddha was and what he was actually doing and uh, how did he do it is the next question we want to ask. How exactly uh, did he do this uh, practice that he was teaching the monks? And what he was basically doing was he was trying to teach you how to shift your mindset from personal side, which is the selfishness, which is the I, the me, the my, the mine, always being in the picture, to the selfless side of uh, your perspective of life, which would be the absence of I, me, my, and mine, where you could look at what was happening around you, but not be involved in it personally. So this gives you the opportunity to open up yourself to the idea of compassion. Compassion is an interesting word. Compassion is a word that actually means, in Buddhist terms, we would allow a person, see a person in pain, allow the person to have their pain, with the space to have their pain, and love them unconditionally. That means to support them, but to do it with the understanding that we cannot take that person's pain uh, away from them. Why? Because there is a cause for that person's pain. There are conditions that make it that it's there, and that's the truth for the person at that moment. It means that you can make the person comfortable, but you cannot personally take the pain away. And this is the difference between um, behaving uh, empathetically, where you walk in a room where someone is in pain and take on their pain and their sadness and depression, or you walk in the room and you understand what I just told you, and you support the person. You offer them comfort and love and support, but you understand clearly you cannot take that person's pain away it is their pain, but you can love and support them. People who are doing social service work or uh, any kind of rehabilitation work or physiotherapy, for them to have this, this understanding is incredibly important. Otherwise, they burn up their energy feeling like they are helpless, that they cannot help this other person. There's a great deal we can do, but there are limits by natural laws and some things we cannot do. So having a clear understanding, this is one really good example of that. Now last time when we visited, I told you that we were attempting to reweave the Dhamma cloth and trying to find the tapestry of truth. The Buddha was doing this the whole time he was teaching for those 45 years. Each time he taught a Dhamma talk, he was creating another thread for that Dhamma cloth. Now today what we're going to do first is we're going to go into a small PowerPoint uh, uh, program and we are going to take a look at some very important words. There's about six words that can really help you to understand what it is that was happening with the training that the Buddha was giving to uh, the people that he was teaching. So let's go into the PowerPoint now. In the beginning, when the meditation students show up, usually it is because they are suffering. 
and they want relief. This can be depression, this can be anxiety, it can be a situation of grief or some very debilitating accident that occurred and the frustration, the anxiety that goes with that. But the basic fact is they want control of their lives. Well, in this respect, the Buddha met us in the middle. He was trying to teach people how to see in order to know the true nature of everything. This is what was happening inside of the Buddhist meditation. He called his approach knowledge and vision. Knowledge and vision is the foundation for knowledge and wisdom to come to be. So the question I had was, well, what was the Buddha's game plan? What was he trying to get us to do and what was he trying to get us to discover? He was trying to get us to see and understand a few fine points. And he was teaching us how to be able to see that so we could understand it. He wanted us to see how certain phenomena arise or they are originate, their origination. He wanted us to notice that when there is a disappearance of these phenomena, that we don't have anything to do with that when it happens. And he wanted us to see the gratification level. That means how do we get involved with it when it arises. And he wanted us to know the danger of that, um, how that takes us away from the present moment and sucks away our energy for what we have to do right now. And he wanted us to understand there was an escape from suffering. And his uh, goal was for you to gain full stability in your life. There is an oxymoron in Buddhism, and I had to giggle at this when I first found it, and I went running to my teacher and I said, I think I found an oxymoron. An oxymoron is when I tell you, you can have something by doing completely the opposite, and there's one of these in Buddhism. To get control of your life, first, you have to give up all control in order to see clearly how things actually work. And what this means is when you are meditating, one of the main reasons that we do not make progress is because we uh, simply get in the way. We personally refuse to step out of the way. So how do we reach a peace of mind from here? Well, how do we do that? The first step is being open to refining some word definitions that we might already think we traditionally know. But uh, just consider this uh, cleaning up the points of your engine and getting ready to start on this journey. Just look at it that way. And just for if you have had training before, try to just take a look at this terminology so we're talking on the same language on the same page as we go along here. Um, just try it out and see what happens. So what words do we need to know? What am I talking about? Meditation is the first word. We'll just, let's say we're going to consider this our vehicle for transportation to discover what is really happening. And mindfulness, we're going to pretend it's the engine that keeps that meditation going. Delusion triggers the problem that we face on the journey, and craving starts unwholesome tendencies in us that we want to let go. And purification of mind, the phrase purification of mind, was what was advised by the Buddha, and he told us we needed to retrain our mind, and it's retraining of our mind which offers the relief that we are seeking. And they called this bhavana in the Pali. First word was meditation. Meditation is, by definition, observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how things work. It's about noticing each time that you are pulled away from what you are doing in your life and how that actually happens.
That's what you're doing when you're meditating. You may have an object when you're meditating, but when you have that object, it's only a home base for you to return to if you're pulled away. It doesn't have any information for you. What you really want to understand is you want to understand the mechanics of how mind moves from one thing to another. The next word is mindfulness. Mindfulness means remembering to keep this kind of observation going all the time and knowing what to do when something comes up. You know, it's really interesting that uh, we have this meditation and this Buddhist uh, practice, but in the West we tend to keep this practice separated from our lives. Our lives is one place and our meditation is another. If we're living here, okay, we, ha we, we think, well, we have to go to the temple to meditate, go to the mountain to meditate, go to the retreat to meditate. But the reality is, the reality is that meditation is life and life is meditation. That is the reality of the situation. This is what the Buddha wanted you to figure out. He wanted you to discover that this was something you could do all the time so that mind could change its habits. Delusion is a word that is misunderstood. We take a lot of the words in Buddhism. Uh, we were discussing this recently at a conference, um, a group of us, that you can get very confused about Buddhism if you take the words used in the translations in Buddhism uh, in English and you s go to Webster's Dictionary to find out what they mean. So delusion in Webster's Dictionary kind of means like, well, you're just confused, you're deluded, you're mixed up. But the question in Buddhism is more precise than that. What are you mixed up about? They have it meaning something else. Delusion is talked about in the Mahu who is deluded has not abandoned the, taint, the taints and you have, you have not abandoned these taints and you're still taking things personally due to the false idea of a self. And this is also mentioned in um, the questions and answers sutta that is found in the Majjhima Nikaya. But this is the source of your tension and tightness. When, when we say to you, well, the, the, the suffering is the dissatisfaction, if there's no me, there's no dissatisfaction. If I don't like something, I have to be there not to like it. So if I let it go and take things impersonally, then delusion gets diminished. Let's go to another one. Craving is one of the biggest uh, words in Buddhism because craving was said to be the root of the suffering. The Buddha said this was the root of suffering. Craving is interesting because craving has a symptom. And if something has a symptom, then you can probably figure out what's, how to fix that or how to cure the disease. Or if the bike is broken, you see what's wrong, you can fix the bike. So here we have craving always manifest, that means it shows up first as tension and tightness in mind and in body. It is the I don't like it or it is the I like it mind. The primary symptom of the craving is always tension and tightness. Now, medically speaking, um, this is pretty interesting because Tension in a person leads to stress disorders, leads to depression, leads to disease or dis-ease of the body and the mind. And that's where the suffering comes from. Depression is happening on the planet right now in the uh, industrialized nations of the world throughout Europe and the United States and, and other industrialized nations of the world are facing four out of every five people on the street taking medication for depression at this time according to the World Health Organization. 
The next one was purification of mind, and this one was a phrase which we see happening in the text and in some of the commentaries. What does purification of mind mean? It means shifting you from unwholesome mind states to wholesome mind states. It means uh, taking the unwholesome, which is tension and tightness in mind and body, and turning it into the wholesome, which is clear thinking with lower, much lower, if any, tension and tightness. And one day, achieving a level of Nibbana, no tension and tightness in the mind or body. And another word for that is Nipapancha. We'll talk about the word Papancha another day, but it means when you th you don't like something then you talk about the story about why you don't like it and it gets so big that you don't have any present moment anymore and the opposite of that is no more thinking like that no more imagination no more extra thoughts taking something just essentially as it is and that would be nipa pancha which is equivalent to nibbana and the last one that the Buddha used many times in the text was he wanted us to retrain mind. The retraining of mind is called bhavana in the Pali, and it means development of mind. Must, this must take place in order for you to uh, reach any state of real relief on any permanent basis. The goal of this practice is to create a new and wholesome habitual tendency of letting go and relaxing all of the tension and tightness in your mind and your body. Thereby, you are opening the mind up, smiling more easily, and thinking about new and wholesome creative solutions for this peaceful coexistence that everyone wants to see take place on the globe. Did the Buddha present such a solution like this? Did he do that? He did. In the text, um, it, we see in a number of places that there is something called right effort. Right effort appears in the Eightfold Path as one of the folds of that path. But the actual meaning of right effort today sometimes comes across as you need to work harder, you need to put more effort into your practice. That's all they say. But they don't ever really explain sometimes to us what right effort was according to the Buddha. So this little chart shows you right effort is a skeleton practice. It's like a secret little skeleton practice that sits underneath the most all of the uh, meditation practices moving towards the goal of Nibbana and how it works is it has four simple steps. The first step is to recognize unwholesome mind states. We said that those have tension and tightness so when you feel that happening you're recognizing an unwholesome mind state. Unwholesome for your mind, unwholesome for your body. You, the second step is you release unwholesome mind states. You let them go and you relax. See, releasing and relaxing are two steps, not just one. The third step is to bring up a wholesome mind state and we like to say re-smile. You always see the Buddha statues smiling with the light joy and they experience within the uh, deeper states they have this little smile on their face and it's the loving kindness and the karuna that's coming up and it's flowing out of them and when they're sitting they still have this little smile and the interesting part about this is that in uh, India they've done a lot of research now on smiling and they've done a lot of research uh, in the United States and they found out that if you just raise the corners of your mouth you don't have to want to smile, but if you keep your mouth closed. And remember last time we talked about the mind is, the brain is like this. It has two lobes that are together like this. On top of that, there is a thin membrane on top that is called the meninges. The meninges, whenever there is any stress, 
tightens and presses these two hemispheres together. This is what causes the tension headaches that people have often experienced. So when you release something, when, when you're pulled away from the, your attention on an object of meditation, or you are pulled away from staying on a particular task that you are doing, when that happens, you reach over and grab whatever it is that came up. Your attention's now over there. We say, please, just release but then also relax, relax. And then come back to the object of meditation and continue. And when you relax, smile and come back. The smiling will help to open up these tiny, the, the tiny little space in between. But you want to open that up. Now why is it so important to open that up? Is because of the pineal gland. And the pineal gland needs to be able to open up for you to be able to transcend and get clear thinking and be able to go into the deeper states of meditation naturally. In order to do this, we have to be extremely gentle. We have to open up these two lobes, these two uh, hemispheres, just slightly to relax it so this can start to function properly and this is what that's about so smiling helps to trigger the opening up we don't know why we just know it works we've seen it on the EEGs we understand it works and we've seen it on some of the more powerful equipment and so I remember students coming to the teacher and saying you know but I don't want to smile I don't feel like smiling and he'll just say, I don't care, smile anyway. <laughs> I don't care, just keep smiling. Because the smiling triggers a different type of response in the brain. And this is what we're trying to get you to experience. So smile anyway, <laughs> okay? Now, keeping the last step is keeping the wholesome mind states going once they you bring them up. You keep them going, and you repeat that when you are pulled away. So that is, that's your cycle. So let's go back to the last slide. So the solution, he said, was mind development, or mind training the mind, with the practice of right effort. Instead of holding on, he wanted you to let go. And this is just showing you that cycle of recognizing the tension and tightness, then releasing and relaxing. The third one is to re-smile and to return to the object of meditation and then repeat. And you can do this practice anywhere, anywhere you want. Each time you do this cycle, this is really important. You are witnessing for real. You are seeing the, uh, the Four Noble Truths happening. You are seeing witnessing dependent origination as it's happening within the event that you're involved in not all the tiny ones that are buzzing by that we can't see and they don't doesn't help us I mean it's nice to know they're there but it doesn't help us but I'm talking about the event that you are involved in you're beginning to see how that works each time you run the cycle and the three characteristics of existence you remember what they were this was anicca, dukkha, anatta. This was impermanence, the suffering, and the uh, impersonal nature of everything. So let's look at that. Let's just talk a minute about that. Each time we practice this cycle, we're seeing the entire Eightfold Path. Come back over to me, and I think what you're going to see is that you have the Four Noble Truths, whereas there's suffering, there is a cause, there is a cessation. And then there's the path to the cessation. So each time we run this cycle, we begin to see the suffering is the arising tension and tightness. And when uh, we see that, we, we feel that the tension and tightness, and then we know that the tension and tightness is the cause, then we experience the cessation of suffering when we release and relax every time. And when you release, 
you do not experience the cessation, but if you release and then relax, there is a tiny point before, as you're returning to do what you're doing or to your object of meditation, there's a tiny point where there is no craving, there is cessation, complete cessation. So what you are witnessing is a tiny visit to the cessation of suffering. This is like a little mundane Nibbana experience of s noticing and seeing this tiny little spot, tiny, 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 as you come back. So we are experiencing these principal parts of the Dhamma every single time we practice. Practice is something you can do all the time. You can run this practice while you are washing clothes, while you are driving the car, anything at all. It's, it helps you to let go, uh, reduce the stress, let go of the stress disorder. It starts to disappear. And the anger, it breaks the anger in half. We'll talk a little bit more about anger too. The depression is countered by this practice. And in the next, uh, next, uh, uh, next one of these that we do, I want to expressly show you an example of anger and show you an example of depression. It will help you with anxiety attacks. It will help you sleep a lot. And it will relieve the grief. We'll also talk about grief. And any damaging reactive emotional states this kind of a practice will help you to just let go. Now, if you want to come back for just a minute to me, um, what I was going to tell you was that the, um, the four kinds of right effort are illustrated in um, Sutta number 77, where the greater discourse of the Sakaludayan is uh, talk is illustrated. And this, uh, this is giving you the exact description for the four steps of the right effort. So these kinds of situations, the stress, the anger, the depression, the anxiety, the grief, or any of these damaging emotional states, these can be solved by properly shifting the person from the cause of these, letting them go when they arise, noticing the symptom that shows you when they arise, and then bringing up something else and replacing it. And the most important part of this lesson is the lesson that you cannot just let something go without bringing something up to replace it. This is what's really important. The last part of this is that when you are handling a situation of any kind that was on that list, we're going to talk about those in the next uh, talk that I give, but when you are handling any of those things, you always remember that there are natural laws in the universe. And one of the natural laws is you cannot li leave a hole. So if a person has a bad habitual tendency, you recognize that and you see the causes they don't understand and you retrain them to learn how to experience the cessation of that. They have to continually keep doing that, but they have to bring up something in replace of it. Otherwise, they will not eliminate the negative. They will not eliminate permanently or for any period of time the unwholesome state. So when we're training, we always have to look at how is this working? How is this operating? How is the suffering happening? That's what the Buddha was doing that's different from psychology. Because psychology, I have had experiences with my friends uh, in the States go to a psychologist for any number of years saying, sit down, let's talk about why you are depressed. And, it, and I finally got this image in my mind of a bicycle. I'm riding a bicycle. My bicycle breaks. I'm sitting on the hill and I'm looking at that bike and I'm crying my eyes out. I can't keep up with everyone else because my bike broke. But if I had only realized how it was broken, I could have fixed it. 
So next time when we come back, I will show you how the energy keeps moving and moving, this unwholesome energy, and how we can help alleviate that.